To be successful in, in our business and most other business, you need to stay close to, to customers and, and, li- and listen to them, what is important to them. And I mean, we could really see this coming over, over the past years. Hydrogen, the most abundant element on Earth, has been hailed for decades as a beacon of the coming clean energy revolution. So why has it still not arrived? And why is everyone all of a sudden talking about green hydrogen? My name is Nico Johnson, and I'm your host as we navigate the hype, the hope, the reality, and the fiction in this search for truth in green hydrogen. This five-part series presents unique perspectives on how each of us might play a role in the greening of the hydrogen economy, the massive opportunities, and potential pitfalls that come with it. Green Hydrogen is a production of Suncast Media, and Season 1 is brought to you by Intersect Power. In this, the last of our five-part series, we are going to hear from Joachim von Schäler of the Lind Group. Many of you already know that Lind Group is the largest gas provider in the world. He's the Global Director of Commercialization and has been at Linda for 25 years. He now serves as the Global Director of Commercialization and has tackled a broad swath of opportunity within the organization. With a mix of research and industry background, he joined the industrial gases industry in 1996. His focus has been on extending the practical use of new technologies, and he's a world authority on the use of oxyfuel, especially in the steel industry. With seven patents and more than 150 papers to his name in the steel and base metals production sector, he is a veritable expert on energy and emission conservation and material recycling. It is truly insightful to hear Joachim's perspective on the necessity, the pitfalls, the partnerships, and the coming global wave of the green hydrogen economy. All right, well, we continue to unpack how the hydrogen economy is going to impact many different sectors to decarbonize our electricity grid and our industrial processes. And today's conversation is going to help us particularly dive into the most carbon intensive sectors that we are looking to decarbonize. My guest is Joachim von Schell. He is Linde Group's global director of commercialization. He's been with the organization for more than two decades. If you're unfamiliar with Linda, it is the world's largest industrial gases company, more than 30 billion US dollars a year in revenues selling to over a hundred countries. And Joachim has been involved in multiple different business units. He'll tell us more about that. But first, let's say hello to today's guest, Joachim. Thanks for joining us on Suncast. Hi, Nico. Thank you very, very much for having me. It's a great pleasure being here and discussing this extremely interesting topic. You know, this is the, the big transition of our lifetime, maybe, <laughs> for many of us. It, it, re- it really is. And, you know, you've been involved in a very carbon intense and energy intense industry, and many of them, uh, throughout your career. For those who are unfamiliar with Linda, can you give a <clears throat> brief overview of the business? and what your role has been, how it's evolved in the company over the last two and a half decades? Sure. So so we are, uh, as you mentioned, like we, we are the world's largest industrial gases company. We, we have both grown through uh, acquisitions and also, of course, organically over the years. And the latest thing when it comes to acquisitions and mergers uh, is is that Linda and uh, Praxa merged slightly. Like, like some, some two or three years ago to, mm-hmm. to form what, what we have today. So so that, that makes us the biggest one in the world. And we are not only in 100 countries, we are also in so many different industrial sectors. And that includes also, of course, hospitals. That has been something very, very much during the COVID times. But, but also when you look at the, the like steel or, or the chemical sectors, so we are a lot there and, and all type of manufacturing industries and so, so on and so forth. So uh, for me, being in, in this business for yeah, two and a half decades, it has been a fantastic journey because I've been touching and learning about new things like, like every day in, in different roles. And uh, with that global footprint, uh, I've been working in many countries. Uh, I think I've done business in more than 40 countries. I managed to ca- count one day. Wow. 
uh, <laughs> and uh, I lived in a few as well. So, yeah. so uh, I, I came back last year to to Europe after spending uh, ten years in Asia. For, first based in India and, and later on based in China. So I got a little bit different perspectives on on, on the world as well. And uh, today I, I carry responsibility related to commercialization, business development for heavier industries. And, and in our context, we talk about here, these are typically those industries that you call hard to abate. You know, yeah. Th- these are all the bad guys when it comes to CO2. <laughs> and so th- those are the ones that, that I, uh, I work together with my team, of course, globally with and I see how we can support them on, on, on a decarbonization journey. And of course, in, in the first instance, to, to become more energy efficient as well. You know, that, yeah. that, that's the first step in decarbonization. It's really refreshing, candidly, to have conversations around the globe with professionals like yourself who are working in highly energy and carbon intensive sectors and are focused on decarbonization. What is, for you, at least in 21 and 2022, the most challenging part of your job when you look at commercialization for Linda? Well, I think when it comes to comes into this area, which which it does, you know, it's like it has been for the past eighteen months, twenty four seven. We talk decarbonization, <laughs> and we talk hydrogen, yeah. and, and hydrogen is the magic word here. The most challenging in that is to to calibrate people's expectations. So a lot of people who we didn't talk to in the past are suddenly coming to us and say, mm. "Hey, we want we want hydrogen. We want this to happen." overnight and, and how, how can we do this and and then you have to slowly take them on to, to let's say a, a bit of a learning journey to, to understand that this is not that simple right there there are a number of steps in this and it, it, and, and the hydrogen as it is today is not available commercially in that big it's not that abundantly available, better say, at, at, at a viable price. Yeah. We, as a, we as a company has worked with hydrogen for, for many decades, but that has been in for, for limited uses, like in heat treatment and, and, and so on and so forth. And now suddenly all these people come and want all this uh, huge scale to happen overnight. And then you, you have, to, have to make people understand that without making them disappointed at the same yeah. time. Yeah. That, that's a very important point, right? And in, in you're, as director of commercialization, you're effectively in a sales role, business development role, Absolutely. finding, finding mm-hmm. avenues for existing assets and trying to help the company think about how to partner and develop new assets. Mm-hmm. I find it very interesting. It's, I, don't, I don't think it's very common for someone who is so very focused on, as you say, hard to abate industries to be as outwardly vocal as you are on your focus to decarbonization. It's one of the reasons why you know, we thought it would be a great opportunity to have this conversation with you. In fact, the first line of your LinkedIn profile says a strong focus on decarbonization and hydrogen related solutions. I think that is fantastic. So where are you placing most of your focus and especially with regard to the energy transition in your day-to-day work? No, it's, it's definitely uh, on, on the steel industry. The steel industry is very important to, to us all, and, and of course, to Linda as a company as well. It has been a tremendous focus on the steel industry, not at yeah. least in, in, in Europe, uh, where, where I'm based, uh, but I'm, I'm looking globally and we see, see that uh, the, the same thing happening in many, many countries. So, yeah. so the steel industry, a lot of people have maybe forgotten about it, uh, that it exists, or they only associated it with, you know, people lost their jobs, they were shutting down here and there and, and suddenly it has a focus here on decarbonization and some of our customers out there they had done a fantastic job and, and start to, to to talk about how to produce green steel so mm. so they, they, they gone in from being you know kind of in the backwaters in, into being in the forefront yeah. also uh, among the industries which of course then, then, then uh, is a uh, it's something that where we are very much involved in those conversations and how we we as a company can support those agendas. So, so that, yeah. that's absolutely thrilling, and that's that that is the number one priority, I would say. 
to be successful in, in our business and most other businesses, you need to stay close to, to customers and, and, li- and listen to them, what is important to them. And, and we, we could really see this coming over, over the past years. And we were, we were quick to act and, and, and to, to support. Uh, so it, it's, it's driven very much from the reactions that we are reacting to, to our customers in a positive way from the dialogues that we have. As you said, steel is sometimes a forgotten industry. I think hydrogen qualifies there. A lot of folks, when I first got into the solar industry, were talking about hydrogen because around you know the aughts, 2005, six, famously California was declaring the hydrogen highway. It was big hype about auto transport, hydrogen, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, and it would lead one to believe then and now that somehow hydrogen is a, a new thing, but it's not new at all. It's a very large business. From Linda's customer perspective, can you talk about the historical context of hydrogen and perhaps even the primary uses and how you're seeing hydrogen supply as a, as a role for Linda? So Linda has been active across the, the, the hydrogen value chain for many decades. So, so we, we have been the supplier of plants. We, we have basically a business model where we build, own, and operate plants for our customers. And of course, we take part of those hydrogen volumes out to a merchant market. So we, we can we liquefy that, we store it. We sometimes we have, are also using pipelines in, in, in the like in Texas, and uh, where we also have a huge caverns. And uh, we take it off for, for, for other type of uses and, and, and applications. But the basis here, if you look at the hydrogen production in the world, which is probably 120 million tons or so a year today, the vast majority of that happens in, in the chemical sector. And, it, and that is hydrogen that is used for different purposes inside those, those industries. So it doesn't come out of there. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a captive production that, that takes place there. And, and uh, I mean, it, it, for, 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 for us, outside of France, so to speak, it's just a number in the statistics. It has nothing to do with, <laughs> with the rest of the world, you know? Yeah. So, so, so there is a minor part of it that is used and, 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 and traded to, to, to a larger extent mm. there. Uh, and what are, what are some of the, for those who are completely unfamiliar, you know, we talked a little bit about, about steel, but could you sort of map out where historically hydrogen has been most utilized? Yeah, mo- most utilized inside the chemical industries and uh, we have, have ammonia and connect to that largely so 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 that, that that's the prime use is, is yeah. in this uh, this type of industry if we look at look at hydrogen being used more so to speak uh, in, in the merchant markets that that is rather in, in processes uh, for for a heat treatment, or it could be as a, as a component in some 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 welding gas and and, and that, that kind of thing, which where it plays very very crucial, very essential roles, but it's, yeah. it's ra- rather small volumes. Then. Right. Well, I think that it's important. We'll discuss why the concept of volume is important, but I think it's interesting for folks to recognize that it's not just say ammonia and and other heavy chemical processes and steel. But there are niche areas that folks can look into. As you mentioned, welding gases, one that I wasn't familiar with, where at least, in, I'll say in the near term, we're not talking about a 20, 30 year project development cycle. In the near term, folks that are looking for offtake of hydrogen might be able to think outside of the realm we're going to discuss pr- primarily today, and that is steel. The IEA report from last fall, which I'm sure you've read on Iron and Steel Technology Roadmap, I'm going to just read from it because I think it's very instructive for those who maybe haven't done the research on this. The iron and steel sector directly accounts for 2.6 gigatons. That's right. You heard it right. Gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions annually, which if you're doing the math is roughly 7% of the global total from the energy system. And it's more than the emissions from all road freight. The steel sector is currently the largest industrial consumer of coal which provides about 75% of its energy demand. Coal is used to generate heat to make coke, which is the instrument instrumental in the chemical reactions necessary to produce steel from iron ore. I know you talked a bunch in a podcast that we're going to reference here once or twice. I'm going to link to for our listeners uh, with Colin Richardson over at Argus Metals about how steel is, is decarbonized. He actually referenced it's the skeleton of industrial production, which is you know just how carbon intensive and how hard to abate, to your point. I'd like for us to have a discussion here about the decarbonization of steel specifically, but I think where we need to start, can you help 
those unfamiliar with the process understand the two primary methods for making steel and why exactly it's so energy intensive and and hard to abate mm. from a carbon perspective? Yes. So so there are two main roads. So first of all, it's it's about 2,000 million tons of steel produced in the world. So quite, quite, quite a huge number. About half of that is produced in China. Then looking at the whole, about 70% of the steel production comes from the primary road, which is the one using iron ore. So we dig up iron ore from the, from the mines, and, and that iron ore has to be reduced, as, as it's called. It means that we take away the oxygen that is attached to the iron in, in, in the mineral. And we do that by a reaction where carbon is reacting with the oxygen into carbon, uh, carbon monoxide and then later to, to carbon dioxide. And that takes place in these huge so-called blast furnaces that are big shafts where coke with them representing the, the carbon here and this iron ore are charged from the top of it. And then slowly it goes through that. And at the end, you've got the molten product that you take out from it, that, which is then predominantly iron. And that, that, that you later on turn into to steel. So that, that's the primary stuff. So that, that starts, starts with the iron ore and it uses a lot of, of, of coke and thereby a lot of carbon and thereby a lot of carbon footprint, 70% of the total. And, and in some big steel producing countries like China, it's 90% because this is, was the way for them to ramp it up. And you will understand that when we talk about the other road, which is that we, we collect scrap. Basically, we use scrap and we melt that, and we mel melt that with using electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have so-called electric arc furnaces where we create an electric arc that is a, thousand, a couple of thousand or 3,000 degrees hot that helps us melting this scrap. So, so And then, then we got more or less scrap, that scrap directly turned into a liquid steel that we can cast and form later on. So these are the two and if we look at the carbon footprint between these two of course the first one the primary one with all that coke and blast furnaces that has a carbon footprint of, of somewhere two or 2.2 2.3 tons uh, of uh, carbon dioxide uh, emitted per ton of steel produced whilst the the, the other one where we recycle the recycling one where we collect the scrap and melt that has a fraction of it, it could be like, like five, six, seven hundred kilograms per, per ton of steel produced. So, so a third or, or even less compared to, to, to the primary one. Mm -hmm. And of course, over time, we get, uh, if we don't increase the steel production too much further, then we have more and more scrap that we can collect, which, which helps us on, on this journey as well. Do I did, Anyway, th these are the two main ones. Yeah, that's super helpful. Are, are both methods capable of being made less carbon intensive? Yes, and we have had uh, had a good trend also, we should say. I mean, this is the, the blast furnace uh, first uh, came into use uh, more, more than a thousand years ago, but, but the modern blast furnace is not the same as, as it was in the Middle Ages. So it's, it's quite an efficient piece of equipment. You know, from an energy point of view, you can talk about 90% efficiency, but the problem is that you still would need need, need the, the, the coke there, the, yeah. the, the coal, trans, coal transferred into Cool. So we can do a bit more there. Definitely, we can we can inject different type of, of low carbon uh, materials to replace the coke to a certain extent. We could also think about uh, injecting some some nitrogen to do a part of this reduction work there there and so on. We should keep in mind when we talk about steel that that, that we need virgin material. Done also because the scrap tends to be a bit contaminated, so we need to to have virgin material to make the most uh, sophisticated, more pure, so to speak, steel grades. And there we have, of course, another alternative that has been very much brought up lately, which is the direct reduced iron road that has been there for many decades, but but on a smaller scale. That can replace the blast furnace also uh, to stepwise. I see. Joachim, with regard to decarbonization of steel, how 
specifically does hydrogen play a role then? There are two roles, I would say. One is to use it as a reductant and, and, and back to the blast furnace, et cetera, where, where the hydrogen can then replace a carbon as, uh, as the one that is picking this, uh, picking up these uh, oxygen molecules from, from the iron ore, so to speak. The other one is to use it as a fuel because the, the, we, we, we also need, uh, need a fuel downstream uh, steam making processes, mm. for example, to heat up the, the, the slabs or billets, whatever we have cast before we, we roll them into, into the sheets and so on to make them into outer bodies and, 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 and our fridges and uh, freezers. Yeah. That's that's all right. So either in the blast furnaces as a replacement to pick up the oxy molecules or as a fuel downstream. Yes, uh, and, and, and in, in the first case, it might not be in the blast furnace that we, we use this other process. Gotcha. And, and so in, all, in both cases, the decarbonization of electric arc furnaces really, because it's an electric furnace, is going to come back to how is that electricity being generated, right? That's how we decarbonize it. That is uh, definitely an important part there. And, and if, if green power can be used in electric arc furnaces, that's an important first step. For someone like myself who hasn't spent years, let alone decades, in you know, evaluating this process and really understanding it, sometimes have a hard time really wrapping my head around exactly where the green electrons, if we want to use any electrons or how hydrogen in an, an electricity form or a raw hydrogen form is used to decarbonize steel. And we're going to talk about the different ways it could be utilized or, or generated, but what processes or where in the process are we replacing existing mechanisms with sort of hydrogen-friendly mechanisms? If we shift over from using this blast furnace that is very carbon intensive to using a so-called direct reduction process, which today represents about 5% of the, the world output mm -hmm. of steel, most of that is based on using natural gas. If we then replace that natural gas with hydrogen in that process, then we can, can then make steel, that, green steel, so to right. simplify it in, in, in that way. And that product that we get out from there, we charge into the electric arc furnace. Either 100% of that, but probably together with scrap as we do today. I'm glad that you used the term green hydrogen. We haven't talked about it yet in this discussion. And I am curious to dig into an aspect that is, I think, often it is, it's even contentious in the industry at the moment. You discussed how direct reduced is presently powered by and large by natural gas as, as a fuel source. And then you mentioned green. So a, a lot has been discussed about gray, blue, uh, and green. First of all, does the color of the hydrogen matter uh, with regard to, I'll call it decarbonizing the sector. And, uh, and I'd like to dig in a bit more around how we differentiate between blue or green is, and, and how maybe you differentiate and your customers differentiate between it. The vast majority of, of the hydrogen produced today is what we can call black or, or, or gray hydrogen. So, so uh, it's, it's using uh, natural gas, methane, so for its production. If we look at the the, uh, the amount of, of, of percentage, but to say of hydrogen that is produced using uh, electricity to split up water, what we call electrolysis, that's just a few percent of the of, of the total. It's maybe five percent or something like that to, today, and out of that, it's maybe just a fraction that is using green power for mm. that. So. All in all, looking at the total hydrogen production in the world, it's, it's like half a percent or so that can be classified as green hydrogen, meaning that, that we're having green power into an electrolyzer to produce. And it's important to, to, to remember this because when we talk about the scale up of, of, of hydrogen production, it's not... We don't want really uh, fully to scale up the whole of this. We want to scale up the clean part of it mm -hmm. or, or even the green part of it. And then uh, in that context, we should, should mention blue hydrogen, mm -hmm. which, is the, which is the gray hydrogen where we are taking care of the CO2 that, that comes out to capturing it. Sometimes we, and particularly we as a company, we refer to the blue hydrogen and the green hydrogen together as clean hydrogen. A Got little it, bit clean. about the nomenclature. Mm. That's a really actually uh, interesting one that seems obvious at first 
blush, but it's not something you hear folks talk a lot about. Clean hydrogen, talking about clean energy, but to your point, blue hydrogen, which is effectively scrubbed gray hydrogen, it's scrubbing the carbon out, mixed, you know, the, the two together can be referred to as clean hydrogen. I think that many purists in the renewable sector would probably uh, consider it sort of cohabitating with, uh, with frenemies, but I for sure, when we, as we get into the scale discussion, I'm starting to migrate to the camp that it takes all of us, right? It, <laughs> all the electrons I, I, that we can I, I, generate I, that are that are clean. I, I, I agree, Nico. And yeah. I, I, I think it's we talk. About, there's some words that we shouldn't forgotten forget about uh, when we discuss it. It's about it's about journey. It's about transition, mm-hmm. right? So we cannot make everything happen overnight but we can make progress overnight, right? So we can take certain steps. And it's, of course, there are purists that say that we should not even look at blue hydrogen, but blue hydrogen definitely is better than gray hydrogen. So if we can use blue hydrogen in the transition phase, whilst we get green power available for an increased production of, of, of green hydrogen, I don't see any harm. I see that as a very positive contribution, actually, yeah. to, to, to move us on, on this journey. You know, there's lots of shades, as we've talked about, of hydrogen. I'm curious, which of the industrial applications do you see as being a better fit today and in near term for what we might refer to as clean, and in particular, green hydrogen? You know, zooming out and looking at it from what are we trying to achieve? We are trying to achieve decarbonization. So we should probably look at it, as I say, from the perspective, where do we have the highest impact of mm-hmm. this? And that we coming back to my dear, how to abate the industries that I deal with. This is definitely an, an, an area where, where, where it's, a, it's a good use of, of, yeah. of the clean, clean hydrogen to make things happening. And, and even if it's expensive, I mean, we talk about huge investments, uh, probably th- th- this is uh, still bang for the buck on, on the decarbonization journey. Where do you see drivers for the change in these industries? Uh, is it demand pull from, you know, green steel for cars? You know, how will the green hydrogen compete in these industrial markets? So where, who do you see asking for it and, and how will it compete? Those, those are some of the macro questions that I want to dig into with a few. I, I think there is a lot, lot of pull from consumers uh, and, and uh, our, our customers, are, they, they are listening to their end customers. Automotive is definitely play, playing a role here. It's not the biggest use of steel, for example, in the world that goes into the automotive sector, but it's the, the, the sector that is probably most exposed to the consumers and, they, and, and you know, people, the, 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 the ordinary people like us, we, we, we are concerned about this. And, and, we, and then we look at the car and we say, hey, we want a car that, 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 that is green. Right. Yeah, you see Volvo making announcements that they're using green steel for vehicles, exactly. right? Mm-hmm. And we we don't have any promise of timeline really of when those cars will be all green steel. But that's it's helpful to think about. And it doesn't sound uh, well. It's just so complex with regard to the traditional, you know, the large piece, the top of the funnel where there's the highest energy uh, and carbon intensity. You know, that steel is going into construction, it's going into boat building and aircraft. You know, uh, all all sorts of different applications. Hmm. Is it feasible to decarbonize steel production in the 2050 timeline that many are targeting? Decarbonization, definitely. I mean, this happens as we speak. Will we 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 reach a complete decarbonization by 2050? No. Hmm. We will not. But we will will have, have really makes great progress that, that's for sure yeah. uh, we will see a, a face out of the blast furnaces as we spoke about earlier we will see that happening over time i don't think that there will be that many new blast furnaces built uh, yeah. and instead the, the existing one will, will step by step being replaced mm-hmm. what do you think is when we look at the challenges with respect to decarbonizing huge industries like steel in particular, do you, what is likely to be involved in that tr- transition specifically in terms of migrating from one process to another? Is it shutting down these steam methane reformers that are one of the primary ways of producing hydrogen, right? <laughs> and replacing them with electrolyzers? Uh, are we looking at potentially building entirely new plants? Can you talk to me a bit about the complexity involved in decarbonizing the industry? Mm. Yes, it is definitely complexity because 
if, if we talk about the existing plants and look at uh, looking at Europe, where, 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 where there is a lot of strict legislation coming in more, more stricter and stricter year by year and, and a lot of costs and a, a lot of political push in this direction. Yeah, uh, carbon they, pricing in particular. Carbon pricing, mm-hmm. we, we are now coming close to, to $100 per ton of CO2. Uh, so mm-hmm. we're definitely crossing that during next year because the, the, the allocation of, of, of uh, three emission rights is decreasing uh, all the time now. There, there, there definitely you have to do something with the existing plants. That means that, that you will step by step shift over to, to direct reduction and use of hydrogen. And I would say that that hydrogen need to be put in place in, with electrolysis on site. Yeah. I think we, we should not trust too much about the possibilities of transport hydrogen around, at least not in the short term perspective. We talk about huge volumes, very, very big volumes, and, and they need to be produced on site Mm -hmm. and as it is big volumes it's very huge volumes that also means that we need a lot of of green power we're talking terawatts and terawatts and terawatts to to make this happen so so you see these industries being being a little bit squeezed here between between the the decarbonization agenda and and the and, uh, and the consumers, the poli- politicians, and so on, pushing them there, and a solution that is dependent on the supply of, of green power that seems to take a, a bit longer time. I want to be very specific here. When you say depends on green power, that takes a lot of t- a long time. The green power is here. Green power at sub five dollars a megawatt hour, mm-hmm. five cents a kilowatt hour is is here. We'll probably talk a little bit about what that cost needs to be, but. What is the thing that's taking a long time? And you had mentioned on the Argus podcast that electrolyzers really seem to be the limiting factor in scaling green hydrogen. Can you expound on that notion? Yeah, electrolyzer size has has to come up a lot. You know, so so we are currently building uh, the world's largest one that it will be twenty four megawatt uh, for mm-hmm. for reference that we start up next year, and uh, and then we are looking at uh, at electrolyzers that are a couple of hundred megawatts. And for for the steel, big steel companies, we we we'd probably took the next level. That's gigawatt. So so mm-hmm. so you know, th- thousand megawatt or more. So that, that's a big scale up. But I don't think that will be the limiting factor because okay. because they, these are built more like modules. So so it, you you can you stack them and you can scale them up. Yeah. But again, you need a, you need a green power, and, and that has to 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 be there. And and uh-huh. and I, I see that as more a pace determining factor. I see. So you're actually. Your hypothesis is that we won't be limited by the electrolyzers because they're stackable technology. We'll yes. be, we potentially be limited by the total scale and ramp up of green power as a low cost green electricity fuel for the electrolyzer yes. process. Yes. Huh. Okay. Right. So, so I mean, we, we need to have a viable supply, and we talk about get, getting somewhere so we can get get, get hydrogen costs at below, say, two dollars a kilogram, which means that we need to be and down where are there. We at at, today? We are typically, uh, I would say, at five, six or something like okay. that. Okay. Um, and and then we should keep in mind that the, 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 the vast majority of the cost to produce uh, hydrogen through an electrolyzer is the cost of electricity. So so we need to keep the the, the cost of the green power probably be, let, let's say be, below twenty or, or something like that. Below twenty dollars a megawatt hour. Mm. Okay, but we're already there for the green power. Are you seeing green power that's higher than that? Well, if we are there, that's great. Not everywhere in the world, I can I, I can say. <laughs> and but but we we need to multiply that supply of green power on on a, on a huge scale. So if you look at, I take steel as an example here all the time, but I think it describes this rather well. So the total amount of energy that we need to 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 go into the steel sector, or sorry, the power, the electricity, rather. It is several times more than what is what, what we have today, and all that has to be green. Yeah, all that has to be green. Yeah. so it's an enormous scale up. Yeah, of that supply, or an enormous opportunity for that sake. If if you're developing renewable power. Yeah, for the sake of 
preserving my own uh, integrity in the industry. I just want to redact my statement pre previously. I was doing bad quick math, $20 a megawatt hour is roughly two cents a kilowatt hour. And mm -hmm. roughly the lowest bid prices that we've seen in renewables auctions pr approximate 1.8 to two cents a kilowatt hour. So like 18 to 20. And mm -hmm. that doesn't take into consideration distribution costs and subsidies, et cetera, that are implicit in the process. Really, we're somewhere still in the 50 to 70 best case scenario in the most in the mm -hmm. cheapest places in the world when you talk about like the Atacama Desert and other places like that. And we'll mm -hmm. get into that, I think, in a minute too. So th that's really helpful. So to get hydrogen below $2 a kilogram, we need to have green power consistently at scale below $20 a megawatt hour. I mean, I think that's a great uh, tidbit of information for, for listeners here. As we talk about scale, you also talked a bit about the growth rate just to keep up with the steel industry's growth, where what's the growth rate estimate for hydrogen and green power, green hydrogen required? Yeah, I made an estimate for Europe when we talk about uh, and an, uh, we need an average growth of 50% a year. 50% a year growth. C-A-G-R 50%, yes. <laughs> uh, and again, I, I don't think, think that the electrolysis will, will, will be the bottleneck. So we, we work with a company called ITM Power. We, we are one of the bigger owners of that one. And, and they just uh, earlier this year inaugurated their gigafactory in, in the UK. So they can make a gigawatt uh, production a year. And a month ago, they, they announced that, that, that in 2024, they, they will make five gigawatt in, 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 in that factory. Right? So, so we, we, and, and of course, we are not the only that's, one. So, so, so that's, that's a big scale. And sorry, when you're when you're referring to gigawatts, just so that folks don't get lost, what is the metric you're measuring? Gigawatts of what? Power of the electrolyzers. Got it. Mm. Gigawatts is power of electrolyzers, and presumably those are. You're, it's just it's it's proof that we have gigawatt scale electrolyzers today capable of being deployed, and we just need to. Figure no, out no, no, we we don't we don't have today. We don't I have see. today. I so, so again, the biggest, the biggest one uh, being taken into operation is is uh, twenty four megawatts. So, so it, that's the IT and power. I must have misunderstood you. Yeah, that's the lim limit. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, let's see if we clear this up. We would need gigawatt scale electrolysis for the steel industry, and we don't have that in operation today. Yeah. So. Going from the biggest one that, that is now put into, into operation to that level means a scale-up of about 50 times, from some 20-something to, to a gigawatt. That's okay. We, we can do that in, in a few few years' time horizon. The, 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 that's not an issue. We, we stack them, so, so to speak. But we, are, we, we, are, we, we don't have that, so we can go... We, you and I and everyone cannot go and look at that to, today. It, right. It has not. Hmm. Let's talk about business model because I think it's really important for folks to come be, able, be able to understand what is happening in the relationship with you and ITM, you and ArcelorMittal, how you all participate together and partner. And, and I think it's useful to think about how the gas industry generally has their business model designed and, and apply that to hydrogen. So what's the business model normally applied in industrial gases? We typically have a build own operate business model that goes with steel industries, chemical industries, and, and so on and so yeah. forth, which means that we are, in, if we talk about electrolysis and, and so, or, or air separation units for making oxygen and, 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 and nitrogen, so the same, we would then make the investment and, and, and build. The, the plant. Uh, and when it comes to electrolysis, we would we, we then work together with our partner, ITM Power. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will build that, we will own it, we will operate it, and we will supply se simply uh, the, the hydrogen over the fence to the company, the, mm -hmm. the customer. And that when, when it comes to ele electrolysis, there, there is also an interesting side stream because, you know, when you take water that is H2O and split that up, you also get the O the oxygen yeah. that can be used as well after some of after drying and compression so that could be also a stream that we can su supply yeah so this is this is in general our the the, the model we and many companies uh, work according to how do you see the business models evolve i know that in a previous conversation you mentioned that you think that they will expand and i wonder how given that effectively you know gas Companies are utilities, electric utilities and gas utilities are looking at this industry as well. Let's touch on the nexus of how these business models for private companies like Linda will expand and how they might 
sort of edge into the existing utility business model and, and where you can what you think about that? I think it comes from 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 two ends in a way because you, you see many utility companies uh, being interested in a forward integration right here. Mm-hmm. So instead of selling uh, electrons, they, they want to come into the molecule, <laughs> so, right. so to yep. speak. On the other hand, companies like ourselves would love to find different opportunities to team, and team up with with the suppliers of, of green power and make sure that we can make good good cases together with them because that's a way for us to secure that we have can can then supply green uh, hydrogen. Of course, when you look at the other end of it, working together with 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 uh, industries that are producing something there is normally heat that can, can be of use. And taking heat back is a, uh, to the electrolyzer is a way to, to, to increase the, 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 the yield of an electrolyzer. So you, you see potentially more of a holistic approach, a more integrated approach uh, here instead of these very separated st- steps in, in, in the chain. You know, steel plants have for years been outsourcing gas supply to companies like Linden. Now, a lot of them, some of whom are your customers, are trying to figure out this process of introducing electrolyzers. How do you, as a company, particularly Linda, think about that partnership model? And how should those who might be considering getting into hydrogen production think about the partnership arena with regard to supplying electrolyzers and hydrogen to these hard-to-abate industries? I think we see a, a slight shift. I think that the basic model would remain the same. I think it's favorable for, for, for all parties and, and that the steel producers, for example, focus on the steel and the gas companies to focus on the, on the gases, including, yeah. including hydrogen. However, there are man, at many places in the world, uh, there are projects coming up with different types of public funding and, and things like that, which creates a slightly different situation, mm-hmm. you know, at least in the short-term perspective, where we could rather than sell an electrolyzer to to this company, and it will be part of, the, of, the, of this of the capex that, right. that they are pursuing for the, for their transformation. Yeah, for the tax for the tax benefits is what you're referring to. Yeah, it could be tax benefits, and et cetera. Let's see. It, it might be that, that we will decaptivate that uh, later on. I, I, I don't know. Do you suspect but, then that companies like yourself will, let's, you know, half a decade from now, will kind of take over the model and start leasing these plants back to the, to the end customers instead of them running their own hydrogen and electrolyzer plants? I think we should be open for for flexibility when it, when it comes to to these these kind of things. With our big customers, it's not only about the gases supply. I should, should also say that we 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 also work a lot with the, with the production technologies and how we can help them increasing the energy efficiency. So it's more of a package, big package, big partnerships. Uh, yeah. Also, so so uh, I, I think from both ends, we we should be a little bit careful in breaking that up. I think that this has been quite successful, um, but we might need to modify it slightly going forward, for sure. I'd like to talk a minute about something you said earlier around sort of the the local production and the, the cost of transport. I think this plays into the business model discussion as well. What are the risks inherent in not generating clean, green electrons relatively near their point of use? I think there is a big risk uh, that, that if we are pursuing a decarbonization agenda um, and not having these green electrons available, mm-hmm. we, we need to find a different solution to, to, to fulfill the targets. And that might be to, to, to move production to another place. And that place would, of course, be somewhere where, where there is a abundant viability of, of uh, renewable power. That could be places that are maybe not so, so industrialized today. I could foresee a situation where the blast furnaces in Europe are not uh, fully replaced with DRI production within in Europe, but instead that material is produced elsewhere. It could be in places like Canada, in Brazil, Chile, Australia, Northern Africa, so where, where they use uh, solar power, mm-hmm. where, where they can put up wind turbines in combination with that. And 
and at some of those places you also have iron ore available so you could you can kind of putting this renewable energy well head so to speak on, on the mines and start so instead, producing yes, coupling that. it with mining rather than with the uh, with the steel factory exactly and we, we see europe's largest iron or mining company LKAB located in northern Sweden, they are involved in a project called Hybrid together with Steelmaker SSAB and utility company Vattenfall. And they will now take this to the, in the next years to, to the next level, which means putting this into production scale and uh, fully and uh, now at pilot scale. And that will take place at the LKAB mining sites. And they will, instead of, of supplying the, their iron ore, or in this case, palletized iron ore to, to the steel makers, they will, they will do the reduction work with the DR process using hydrogen there. So they make a, they make a forward integration in the, in the value chain. So, so, they, so, so, so part of the work that previously was done by their customers, they are doing, and they are supplying that because they have green power available up there as well. And I think we, can, we will see this type of things happening elsewhere in the, in the world. Looking at this, it makes a lot of sense for mining companies like LKB, as we said, in, in the northern part of Europe and other companies in other parts of the world to, to, to do this because they have the, the green power available. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the green power available, you can forget about the rest. You know, it doesn't play out uh, at all. So if you are there in the, in the center of Europe and you don't have it, then you have to have sh to shut down the operations. So this practically would be a, a de-industrialization of the, those areas and, and that, wow. that production will be shifted elsewhere. I feel like that's a mic drop moment right there, uh, but there are many other areas I want to explore. So I'm going to continue to probe here, uh, Joachim. You touched on this effectively co-location of now of the reduction on the mining sites. And it starts to look a lot like we see in other industries, in the solar industry in particular as well, like module manufacturing is co-locating with not just glass and pallets, but polysilicon manufacturing. How does that co-location idea of, you know, kind of creating hubs around the hydrogen process play out over the next 20 years? I think it will play a major role to be successful. Again, it's about the, the, avail the availability of, of a viable green power. So when you have that, you, you will you can you will create a cluster around it. And, and once you have it available, you can also look into additional applications and, and uses. I think that if you find a place for, for making steel or, or whatever with, with green power for the hydrogen, there will be hydrogen available at a reasonably low cost that can be used for, for, for trucks and buses and, and, and so on in, in that area. So you, you create an, a kind of green hydrogen island around this where, where you find, find use multiple uses of it once once you have have the core of it established i like that idea i've not heard anyone use the term green hydrogen island so i'm going to attribute it to you for the moment <laughs> around what industries do you think these green hydrogen islands will initially at least solve problems you know we talked about steel can you identify others I think steel is one of them, and we see also refineries. So, so we, we talk about where we, at least in, in, the, in the near future, will see the, 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 the huge installations of electrolysis. And, and that would be typically in the steel industry, in the oil, in the refinery in the refineries. So when yeah. we have these huge scales, we talk about these gigawatts. The, the, around that, I think we can we, we, we will see this bell, the, the, the creation of, of a green hydrogen islands where, where you can find other uses in, in the area. Joachim, in one of our previous episodes, our guest Baraj Borkataria said, the quickest way to shrink scope three emissions is to shrink production. Well, that obviously clearly falls back on industries like steel sectors. I'd like to understand how Linda is thinking about scope one emissions and importantly, how your customers are thinking about it. I think that a way for our customers to, to both be successful commercially and uh, reduce their carbon footprint is to make better pro products simply. Uh, and, you know, if, if all the stuff that we buy during a year, if we use that for another year, 
So, so if the life of, of a car is one more one year longer, so to speak, mm. at the end of the day, we are saving one year of, of CO2 emissions. And if you make a better steel product, for example, that, that, that really allows for this, you can probably also get, get a little bit more paid for it and, and mm. we all get happy, so, so, so yeah. to speak. And we, we, we support that type of thinking. Yeah. And that, that's a way to be, be more sustainable. And of course, an, another thing where we work together with many customers is to increase the, the recycling and, re, and the reusage by different applications. You talked about scope one and it's also scope two and three. And so in, and, and the more we come into, in, into the need for virgin raw material, stuff that we dig up from mines, etc. Typically, the, the larger the carbon footprint, the more we can recycle material, the, the, the lower the carbon footprint. So that, yeah. that's another way. We as a company try, try all we can to buy uh, renewable power uh, for sure and, and drive that agenda. And I would imagine, as we just discussed, that with regard to scope two and three emissions, which are not something that the individual, the steel plant can control directly, which is emission, which is scope one, hubs can play a role here, right? It, being oh, definitely. To- no. no, definitely. But, but, but of course, uh, also steel plants and the likes can choose what, uh, who they are buying their raw material from. Mm. And we as a consumer, when we look at an eco-labeling or, or, or some, what is the carbon footprint of that car, using that example again, mm-hmm. what has happened upstream with the raw materials that have been coming into the, into the process, is that, that plays a quite a big role for yeah. that sake. Are you hearing customers use terms like net carbon intensity? Yes. Yeah. But it's a pretty new discussion, I, I, I yeah. would say. Joachim, our listeners predominantly come from the renewable sector, or at least are exploring how renewables contribute to the overall you know, climate action we want to see in the world, decarbonization of the grid in particular. What role do they have to play to support this industrial decarbonization? They have a major role, without any doubt. And uh, we, we've spoken about it uh, multiple times during our conversation, how extremely important the availability of, of, of the green electrons, of the green power is. Th- that is the key to, to this whole transition. I think that from a larger society perspective, it's also so that, the, the, again, spoke about it, but the places where we can find this will also pl- play a big industrial role because right. we, the, the, we will have a, we will have pr- production of different kinds. We, we, we will have multiple uses around some kind of islands, et cetera, and so on. Mm. So the more they can develop that, the more it can attract uses yeah. around them. Definitely, okay. So there are certainly lots of listeners and lots of friends of mine who are out developing traditional solar and wind and biogas generation plants that are considered green electrons, and they're engaged in both contracted and merchant supply of these electrons, predominantly to the traditional energy grid. With that, you know, I think that Linda and, and, and companies at your scale and scope that are dealing with these carbon intensive processes have a role to play in helping guide these global renewable developers. What does that conversation look or sound like when you're actually speaking to developers who are trying to figure out how to sell green power to mm. ArcelorMittal? Yes, for sure we have those conversations and, and we, are, we are a bit there in between and we can, can bridge it, uh, for sure. We, we, we are a big user of electricity ourselves mm. in, in our processes for, for hygiene and for, for the other gases. We are a good customer, I would say, also because we have very, very stable demands. So we are not very fluctuating or anything. We are very stable. Yeah. And, and many times we also try to partner up with, with, with our own customers that have a more fluctuating demand. So, so all together we, we get, it, get a better solution than they, they would have. Yeah. And we are very open to, to find solutions to partnerships in, with, with the utility suppliers. For us, it's a key to have the, the, the green electrons available for, for us to be successful uh, as well, for sure. Do you see flaws in either the way developers are thinking about approaching the market with the product or the way that end users and like utilities or end customers are thinking about requesting form via you know, formal RFPs? these products, uh, you know, green electrons being delivered? 
how would you contextualize the I would say relative immaturity right now in the market around how we build and sell and transact these electrons. Yeah, I, I think it's a bit immature. I think I think I think there is more to do there, and and there is more to understand from by, by, by different different stakeholders of different kinds here, for for sure. And yeah. and, and uh, we 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 see this going on, but but I I think that the more integrated approach than what we have today would, would be helpful for for everyone. And, mm. and uh, I, I see that as a bit missing. Jakim, what kind of example could you give that would really bring that one to ground for me? If you have a, a supply of, of, of green power, you have companies like us and you have a state producer. Mm -hmm. uh, many times we tend to look at them as three different individual separated entities, right. really, by, by all means. But I think there is a great opportunity and we will try to work together in, in a, a more like pairs working with with the steel company that we have been doing for decades and we can together come down to the supplier of the of the renewable energy and and we we understand if that's an arcelor method and the like we know what they need and and, and they know what we can supply mm. and and we can then create really something that is very solid when when we go to to the uh, renewable power supplier and also coming from the other end, if we work together, companies like Linda, together with the, with the green power supplier, uh, that, and we understand each other well, then, then we have a you know we have an enormous interface around the world with different industries, and we, we can we can then help to integrate that, that part as well. So I, I see that we can really play a role here by by, by pairing ourselves in, in either end and, and, and create a good docking with, 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 with uh, there. In, in the chain. Joachim, I'm going to back up maybe to the 30,000 30, foot level and ask a bit of a philosophical question. What's something that you've changed your mind about recently? I think that I have changed my mind uh, about what is the, what is difficult and what is not difficult when it, when we look uh, upon this transition. First of all, when we talk about the energy transition, uh, I think we all agree upon that that, that it, it's important that that we go in this direction. We need to decrease our impact on planet Earth. That, that, that's for sure. And then then we might have individual opinion about how, how we quantify this and. So on. the difficulties that, that maybe we, I saw back in time was more related to technologies mm. and so on. But I, I'm pretty convinced now that, that how to, if we use the use of hydrogen as an example, as we speak about that, how to use the hydrogen, uh, the technologies and how to produce the hydrogen, that is not the that's not the difficulty. A lot of it is quite well in place. We, we know how to do, do it. It might be a bit of fine tuning. It is definitely about the scale up, but, but uh, I mean, we, we, can, we, can, we can see how that will take place. But the difficulty is, is elsewhere. The difficulty is to, to make sure that, that we get this stuff running because we, we need this green power. We, we, we need to, we need to, to uh, be able to, to, to be in a place where, where this is viable. So, so I think that, which is, we talk, spoke about this potential geographical shifts. And so I think that is where the difficulties lie. So the, the, I think this is how I have changed my mind. I, I thought it was about the technologies, but it's not, you know, if, uh, as such, how to, how to use it, how to apply it. No, it's, it's upstream and uh, rather. And, and if, it's not, if it's not there again, it, 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 the rest doesn't work. Joachim, what sacrifices will we have to make to achieve the hydrogen economy that you envision? We need a power. We need a green power. I think that in most countries over the years, we have we have increased our own use of, of electricity year by year. I think we need to be more careful about that because mm. we would need those electrons to to support the decarbonization. Uh, so, so we uh -huh. cannot. We, 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 I think that's that's a bit of a sacrifice we might might have to to do our, ourselves and, and try to be more efficient in in our own lives because we can we cannot have everything. Everything at, at at the same time. So I, I think we will 
we, we, we have to be a little bit more careful about that and uh, including being a bit more sustainable and reuse things our, ourselves and, and you know it's, it's have a bit longer life for our products also have a less turnover if that's a sacrifice I, I'm not so sure I mean, but it's a change of lifestyle you know, on an individual level I've never heard anyone posit what you just said and I think it actually is pretty cons- consistent with not just the European mindset, but in particular, the mindset around uh, efficiency and, and the sort of German practicality of the reality of what we're dealing with, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, and so I want to, re- I want to repeat that for those who maybe had sort of nodded, but didn't really internalize what he just said. I think this is really important. We need to consider how we place our own consumer ideas or desires for clean energy at our home, in our car, et cetera, on the altar of the reality that until we have ubiquitous clean energy supply, all of the electrons could go into decarbonizing heavy industry right now, and we still wouldn't be creating enough. Yes. That's heavy. Very well. <laughs> it's heavy, but it was very well put, Nico. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So let's end on this question. What does this industry look like in 20 years' time? It will be tremendously much bigger that that is for sure will it in 20 years deliver on all these uh, aspirations and all these visions that are there in the big fat headlines uh, today no we need to be realistic about it but we will have taken a huge step forward so this uh, this the world's largest electrolyzer will not be 24 megawatt it it will be rather 2.4 gigawatt mm. right? 100 times bigger here 100 times bigger there still there will be things that to to, to, to do to to fix it but we we are we will be well underway i think also we have changed a bit our own thinking about things uh, and uh, how how we are how how we deal with our own efficiency and our own resources i could say when i lived in china car sharing for mm. example coming up so, so you have an economy that is going in the direction of sharing cars. You don't have any, you don't have cash. Everything is on your phone. You use your phone to pay. You use your phone to order a card, and, and it's not your own car. Mm-hmm. And, and that car might be self. It's a self-driving car. Also, we saw that already in, in Shanghai. So, so I think that, and that creates efficiency, of, of course. And, and we need that. Again, we we need that to facilitate the transition. And I think that if we look at the younger generation of people, they are way more open to, to that as well. And they, yeah. they, they will be grown up in, in 20 years for, for sure. So, so I think that that they will, that will make the, the, the mark on, on how, how, how things look like. And uh, ultimately translating also in, into, the, into the hydrogen industry and, and, and how, how we are viewing things and how we are speeding up the transition. So we will, we will be well on the way with a huge huge scale up of this industry, but we will still have, have, have a quite, quite a bit to go. I love that we've tapped into the philosopher in you, Joachim, because what I heard is it will be orders of magnitude larger. We will tap into the forthcoming generation's lower attachment to ownership and personal direction of these electrons. And that will, in fact, help us scale and prioritize not only how the electrons are created, but where they're directed to create the biggest impact. I, I, I agree, hundred. I agree, hundred yeah. percent. Very well captured. Yes, I agree. Perfect. Joachim van Schella is the global director of commercialization for Lind Group, and he has given us a lot to think about and a deep dive insight into not just the hydrogen economy, but how hard to abate sectors like steel can in fact leverage clean energy and hydrogen to bring us into a decarbonized world. Joachim, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so very, very much. It was a great pleasure talking to you about this fantastically important topic, Nico. Thank you so much. I hope for those of you who had up to now a limited understanding of how the steel industry by and large works, how steam methane reformation and other forms of conversion are used in the process. I hope that it was informative for you. Thank you. Joachim, for such a deep dive on a topic that for many of us in the renewable sector is going to be new information. 
I have in this final episode of the series, again, our friend Sheldon Kimber, CEO of Intersect Power, joining me for the final takeaways on the series. Sheldon, welcome back. Thanks for having me again. Excited to be here and wrapping this thing up with you. Sheldon, I imagine that for someone who has spent the last seven plus years exploring the up and coming green hydrogen reality economy, boom, you may not have learned a ton about the steel industry because you are deep in it. But I'm curious if there's anything in particular that you brought away from the conversation with Joachim that was learning for you, or maybe it was expansion of learning or, or, or augmentation of your learning. I thought he did an amazing job taking us through the depths of various industrial processes. You know, me and my team, as you point out, have done an enormous amount of diligence and work on the parts of the industrial economy that clean energy can can be applied to and how, you know, what those pathways look like. So one of the observations that I will take away from from all of that is just the facility that he has with that information, the depth of his understanding. It's so different than than everything that we, you know, and many of your listeners in the renewables industry are used to, and that there will be a lot of learning for folks who haven't necessarily spent seven years looking at hydrogen or steel or whatever. And so it sort of, again, kind of motivates that theme that we've talked about over and over about partnerships and pairing up and sharing expertise and humbling yourself a little bit as well, right? Doing research on a brand new business, particularly coming out of like a lot of people who've, you know, done well in renewables, they've gotten themselves big titles, they've started companies, they've sold those companies, they've made some money, lots of reasons to be really proud. But what comes next is potentially going to take humility, not pride. Yeah, there's still a lot of maturation left. And even for those who like yourself, have gone through the whole process of internalizing the power industry, understanding hedging the markets, understanding all the esoteric elements that go in to actually trading electrons. And now we have to think about molecules. I'd like to know, as we think about the arc of the series and the narrative, you know, we talked about the scale versus profit matrix in the beginning. We talked about your barbell approach in listening to these five episodes and helping curate this conversation. Do you have any particular, like, you know, top two or three takeaways that have even amplified the way that you're thinking about the hydrogen economy? Yeah, I mean, I think two of them come to mind most acutely, and that is just some of the numbers that people have thrown out in terms of the scale of green power and green, green electrons that are required to electrify hydrogen and, you know, by, by extension, some of these other industries that will be addressed by hydrogen. Joachim hit on a couple of points there where I, it was clear that his, his anxiety as a pr producer of hydrogen and looking to switch to clean hydrogen is in fact the supply of cost-effective clean power. Rafi had the point that it's cost-effective clean power that is really the enabling factor for all of this, not necessarily yeah. even technology. You know, So we've seen this as a theme throughout the episodes. I think I maybe even made the point early on that, that, you know, that we shouldn't take for granted that the cost of, of clean power is going to continuously go down, right? Even, right? even now in the power markets, just for the electric grid, we're seeing, you know, kind of prices bind as there's more demand than there is supply and things like that. Mm -hmm. So this will be the dynamic, right? This is, this is the new, almost kind of like a gold rush, right? How yeah. do we find, we know we have the technology and we know the technology in a world where there are no constraints in the supply chain, right, where there's enough land that can be permitted, where, you know, we're in a steady state of modules and trackers and all that, there's not a bottleneck of tariffs and things like that. In a world where there's no big bottlenecks to supply chain, the LCOE of green electricity is low enough to do all of this, right? Yeah. But what are those bumps in the road that are going to happen over the next 10 years that are going to cause prices to jump around and how is that going to impact all these downstream uses i think that's really fascinating right and mm -hmm. for me just personally it it also kind of motivates me in the sense that my vision is you know this guy you've heard me say it over and over right the nexus of deep decarbonization and i put my hands up like this and i make the little nexus symbol mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know we've got this graphic in our our corporate deck that's that's just at the at the center of all of these things, green hydrogen, direct air capture, all of this at the very mm -hmm. center of all of these things is high capacity factor, low cost, clean electricity. And you've yep. heard me say it over and over and over again, but we're going to need absolutely staggering growth in that yeah. segment to make this all happen. So that that's the first thing got me really excited. 
Yeah. And what's encouraging there is that through all of it, Joachim was the final cherry on top. I heard him in another podcast, but when I was doing the research, he said, without clean, abundant, clean electrons, none of this works. And it undergirds this, this siren call that there is so much opportunity still for renewable de developers who really do educate themselves, as you said, humble themselves and add the complexity as per our last conversation with Rafi, add to that complexity an understanding of the broader energy matrix, not just the delivery of electrons. What did you think about the industrial base uh, as a comprehensive conversation over these five episodes? It seems to me like what we have traditionally understood as sort of where industry is located might be challenged. I thought it was a really interesting observation and it we don't have to necessarily dwell on it, but it but it's one that has come up in multiple of these episodes, uh, and and it came up again in this episode about the fact that we we may well see an actual mass uh, migration of of the industrial base, right? You know, steel production, uh, the production of, of 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 goods, data centers, you know, hydrogen, whatever else that is highly energy intensive, moving into some of these areas of the country or areas of the world with very low cost clean electricity. So yeah. I think that that is a fascinating trend. It's one of those ones where you ask yourself, in a developed country like the United States, given how hard it is to build transmission, it may just be easier to move all the factories. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> that's, the, that's, yeah. So, so Oklahoma, places like Oklahoma, the Midwest, where there's lots of land, we might see an industrial complex uh, stood up there. And, you know, I think one of the things that we haven't talked directly about when we talk about policy throughout all this is the amazing opportunity that presents, not just in the United States, which, which we want to advocate for, but globally for municipalities to really get smart about how to attract the talent and how to attract the industry, because we're going to see a new migration of industry. And it's, it's, the, it's the 50s and, and, and 80s all over again. That is the sad sort of reality of, you can pick any one of 100 arguments for why our mm -hmm. government is broken and backward yeah. and you know lacks forethought. But that is the sad reality of the situation we're in is that our country in particular, we are blessed with a, an embarrassment of riches when it comes yeah. to natural resources, right? And so what's so strange is not only are we post fracking revolution, you know, the new Saudi Arabia of fracked oil and gas, but we also are kind of the Saudi Arabia of clean energy of all the developed economies. We are probably have some of the, the strongest wind and solar resources out there, yet we're afraid of transition. It just seems geopolitically backward. And so before we say goodbye, I'd love to yield the parting word to you. How would you wrap up this Green Hydrogen Series Season 1? First of all, I want to say thank you to you for working with us on this and letting us work with you. And, and it's been actually a great learning experience. I, I, I hope actually that what we've been able to do and, and what we've been able to be a part of is sort of replicating some of what I've had the pleasure of doing over the course of the last few years, which is just having an enormous number of learning conversations with, with folks in this space uh, as we try to transition and build Intersect Power from you know what we already kind of knew what to do when we formed the company, kind of many of us coming out of recurrent into what comes next, right? Into the new clean super major, right? Mm. Uh, or at least what we aspire to be with, yeah. with this, you know, diversified set of clean energy technologies. So my hope is that there's been some, some small taste of that because I've certainly enjoyed that an enormous amount. I think my closing thought would just be that the biggest theme I saw across the board here, the, the absolute largest theme I saw was that the she or he that figures out the value chain uh, mm -hmm. In these new, new industries, the, the, the business model, if you will, do you try to do it all? Do you try to make the green power, run the electrolyzer, feed it into the ammonia plant and sell the ammonia? Or do you partner you know, in, a, in a strategic way? The person and the companies that figure that out well are going to be the people who thrive. What's very, very clear is that the landscape in industrial, you know, in the industrial economy and in the oil and gas industry is completely different and in many cases far more fragmented and specialized and we coming from you know clean power are used to some 
honestly, frankly, pretty primitive business models where we sort of, <laughs> you know, we're just now getting to the point where we stop showing up with our hands outstretched, hoping for someone to give us a contract for 20 years of revenue, right? We're just now getting into the hedging markets and actually realizing that like, oh, wait, there's some dynamism in revenue. I think it will be challenging for many folks who have been sort of packaging those annuities of, of power plants on, the, on, the, on behalf of utilities and lenders to really move into this space. I think the people you'll see moving into this space most aggressively are the renewables companies that have been most flexible on the power marketing and finance side and most creative in those development activities. My hope is that Intersect and, and my team get to be one of those people, but I think that'll be the difference maker in who succeeds here. And that's been, that's been a kind of a interesting theme throughout. Well, complexity is a project developer's best friend. And <laughs> in, all of my, in all of my time in solar and storage, I've never seen anything that even come close to the complexity of trying to unpack and figure out how to do this sector coupling to borrow from the term that we used in the previous conversation of existing oil and gas infrastructure in a way that truly lifts the green hydrogen economy to the place where we can massively and radically decarbonize at gigaton scale, the way that you so eloquently put it in our first episode. Thanks, Nico. I really, again, appreciate the opportunity to work with you guys and spend the time with you. It's actually been a lot of fun. Well, we've all enjoyed getting a chance to peer through the lens uh, and the intersect black book of contacts. Thank you for that. And uh, we'll see you all when we return for season two. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. It's part of a five part series exploring the green hydrogen economy from the perspective of renewable development, technical expertise, financial analysis and commercial opportunity. I hope that you'll subscribe to the show on Spotify and check us out also over on the web at mysuncast.com forward slash hydrogen, where you can read more about each guest, find additional background information and references that we discussed in this episode. If you're totally unfamiliar with me, well, I've interviewed more than 400 founders, leaders, entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs in the clean energy industry over the last six years through my Suncast podcast, all in an effort to help you figure out exactly where you fit in the clean energy transition. If you haven't yet, I'd really encourage you to go listen to Suncast. It's the most comprehensive podcast in existence documenting the rise of the solar and clean energy revolution from the voices of the leaders brave enough to stand on the front lines. This Green Hydrogen podcast is a production of Suncast Media and season one is brought to you by Intersect Power. Thank you for listening. <laughs>